Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you. Frustration and disappointment. I'm sure that's nothing that you've experienced, but it is common out there, I'm told. Just as you say the words frustration, disappointment, are they these kind of words or those kind of words? Okay, yes. When you say it's frustration is a problem, you automatically point inwards. So what is it about the inwards that makes frustration and disappointment align with it? What is underlying states of, let's take perhaps the easier one first, frustration. What underlies frustration? Unfulfilled expectations? It is negative. You've given a more specific, you've given a more general. Not able to achieve your goal. Low tolerance, did you say? Okay. Getting close, you began to say the words which I want. Has it got a lot to do with I want? Impatience. I planned. Impatience is something about I wanting, ego, one more word which I'm looking for. I like the word control. Unable to control. Unable to control outcomes. Unable to, be, to have power over. Is disappointment in any way different? In what way? You have control over it? Well, then that way it's similar. Is it a difference in degree? I wanted to get a sense of the definition of the terms. Is disappointment radically different from frustration? Take yourself back into those states of being and try to identify how different are you facially, internally, when you are frustrated and when you are disappointed. Let's stay, stay, start, stay with the face. Sadder? What sort of face will you have when you're frustrated? Put on a frustrated face to yourself. Come on. Clenching. Everything's clenching. Eyebrows. Teeth. Jaws. Okay. Now put on a face of disappointment. It's different. And therefore it's a different emotion. But how is it different? Look again at yourself in your mind's eye as to what your face looks like in a state of disappointment as opposed to frustration. That's good. I want it right now just to stay with facial expression. How is your face different? Can you identify the differences? That's true too. I want you to describe your face. It's more relaxed than in frustration, but it's not a relaxed face by any stretch of imagination. Good. What else can you tell me? With frustration, there's more contraction. There's more gavura in frustration than in disappointment. More emotion in which? When you think about it, it's hard. What do your eyes do when you're in a state of frustration? What do your eyes do when you're in a state of disappointment? Just think about it or practice it with your eyes closed. Just become a... a, a was it a Strasbourg mode of acting, was it? Strasbourg, right? You have to really put yourself into that. Come on. What do you do with your eyes when you're frustrated? Squeezing. What do you do with your eyes when you're disappointed? Down. 
as opposed to constriction, down. What do you do with your face, with your cheeks in a state of frustration as opposed to a state of disappointment? You'll find that the direction is very similar. Generally, with disappointment, everything drops. Whereas with frustration, everything tenses. All right. See if we can now go to a, a further level of understanding that. Gavura is a level of contraction and strength. We've identified that with frustration. What, what might we identify more with disappointment? Someone said it earlier. Emotion. Ironically, there's a larger range of emotion in disappointment than there is in frustration. Frustration is a much more uniform, straightforward emotion of one typology, whereas disappointment has got a range of emotions mixed in there. It's more complex, in fact. Therefore, which one will last longer? Consensus? Disappointment will last longer? Yeah, because it's got more properties of emotions within it to settle, to subdue, whatever to change, whereas frustration is fairly momentary. Both are not particularly good, we agree. But I wanted us to go through the exercise of those two just to show you the subtleties of our emotions and how we can take these things for granted because the, the way that we will deal with each of them might be radically different. Have a look at point two on page two and see if you agree with the statement. Frustration is a feeling of agitation and intolerance triggered when your needs aren't met. It is an inability to practice delayed gratification. It's not the key to any door. Disappointment is a form of frustration that occurs when expectations are not met. Do you agree or disagree with whatever that author put down as those two statements? Read it closely. I myself have no problem with the first one, but the second one to me makes very little sense. It's trying to define something in context of the other, right? Okay. We're in agreement on that one. Hasidus would say that frustration derives from an attempt to control, strongly ego-centered, and disappointment derives from circumstances outside of you. Okay, have a look at that. Does that sort of capture it? Frustration comes from something that's flowing from within you and deeply embedded in you at that moment, and disappointment is something that is centrally located from outside of you. Isn't that a good observation? Think about that. Let's, uh, not everyone yet, I think, is fully aware of what we're saying here. When you're frustrated, of course it's the result of some external blockage or internal blockage, but something out. But on the other hand, you're generating all that energy of frustration. Disappointment has a lot of that energy being located as a consequence of something outside of you. Either way, we're talking about ego and we're talking about control. So let's now look at the words of control and ego. Is there any circumstance where control can be justified? Absolutely. Controlling the uh, aeroplane is rather important. 
There's a lot of areas where you want to control. Are there in circumstances where you want to control people? And it's legitimate. Children. Is it control or is it just teaching? Well, maybe. What is, is there a difference? You say to your child, I don't want you to play. The child is three years of age. You are not allowed to go through the front gate into the street. And what do you do? Because you don't trust your child, you lock the gate. Isn't that direct control? Does anyone have any problems with that control? Why not? Because it's completely other-centred. It's not ego-centred. Ego means it's generated from here. My needs. It could be that it's your needs. You may be a terribly selfish parent and you don't want anyone else to think of you as a bad parent, so you lock the gate, but you don't really care about the child. You care what other people say. Of course, no parent is ever like that. But that's the nth, de nth degree of ego. But by and large, yes, we control and there's legitimacy in controlling. Where does non-legitimacy of control start? When might it be not legitimate to control? And here, let's talk about people. When it's about you? Power is, yes. True, but what might sometimes control be legitimate? When is it legitimate, when is it illegitimate to try to control an adult, someone else? Then it's, when it's not for the greater good, then what? Then it's not, not legitimate. I'd like to put it in the inverse. When it's just for your needs, then it's illegitimate. When you want to get something out of it, when it's selfish, when you are the centre of gravity, then it is not legitimate. But if it is for the benefit of the other, and this may be correctly or incorrectly interpreted, you may be wrong, but as long as it's your motivation is for the benefit of the other, you can exercise that power. You should exercise that power. If, well, it's called maturity. But who are you to say what's good for someone else when they may not agree with it? That's the way we live. If, someone, if you think that someone else, shooting someone else, shooting a third party is some not good, you should interfere in that scenario. Should you not? Would you have any qualms in trying to prevent a murder? I mean, sorry, I misunderstood. Not in Melbourne today, meaning you would not find it a duty oh, to yes. prevent... Yes. yes, and likewise in Germany. You would find it an absolute duty. You wouldn't. Oh, yes. yes. Sorry, the other way around, I wouldn't. <laughs> would you have a guardian that was, um, was being threatened and wanted to kill the person threatening them? All right, let's make it really simple. Your question was, what's the litmus test? The litmus test is very easy. Is it for you or is it for the other? The lady is asking, sorry, your name again is Lily, Lily is asking, sorry, Lily. Lily is asking, I forget my own children's names, so it's, it's fine. My wife says, I have seven kids, so I go, uh, da, 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 and I finally get the name right, it's okay. Um, So Lily is asking whether it's always legitimate just because you think that it is the right thing to do. Now, I'm not asking whether it's necessarily got absolute right or wrong. Good. That tells me all about you, Lily. Fine. <laughs> 
We're not asking whether you're right or wrong. We're asking whether it's legitimate or illegitimate. So I'll make it easy for you by changing the words. The difference between the words control and assertiveness. And now you'll, it'll be easier for you. I'm going to say for the sake of our discussion, control takes place when we're seeking personal outcomes from a situation. I want to control you because I will gain from it. I want to control the marketplace because I'll make a killing. I want to control you because in that way you serve my needs. That's control. When I'm doing something for, to, to uh, uh, benefit you, it's called assertiveness. Assertiveness is not just legitimate but necessary. Control is never permitted. This has got nothing to do with correct outcomes or not. Your point. I may be completely wrong, but if my motivation is to benefit you, then it's no longer egocentric behaviour. It's no longer a wanton wish for control. I may be very unwise, but I'm still a good person. My advice when there's someone who seeks money is that this is occurring to me because Hashem wants me to make a decision in the moment whether to practice chesed or not. That's called what we're talking about, the flow of chesed. Am I a good person or not a good person? Am I a compassionate individual or not? Now comes a level called mind, wisdom. Will I give them money, which they may then use to buy some more addictive substances for themselves? Or will I go into the supermarket and buy them a pear and a loaf of bread? Okay. So there's two different aspects. Giving, we always have to give. Wisdom, what we give, how we give. Absolutely. My, my issue with that is that everybody has their path in life. And those people, not, I'm certainly not advocating it, but people who take drugs and alcohol are looking to heal their foot in some way. And the way that they've chosen may not be the way that we choose to do it, but they're still in a certain place and it's what their path for them is. <coughs> so... Correct, that we may not be able to interpret sufficiently. That's fine. That's okay. The question is our response, which we're analysing now. We will never know another person fully. Even the person you've been married to for 40 years, you will not know fully. So we'll never be. But the question is, what is our initiative? What is our action? And our action must always be compassionate and giving. Always. Yeah, always. But the point we wanted to make was to make life easier in terms of uh, the litmus test between control and assertiveness. Control is I need, I want. Assertiveness is for your benefit, for your good. It should not be difficult, Gabriel. It should not be difficult. For people who they find difficult to distinguish is because they really want to mask it from themselves. Okay, so going back to frustration, number three here. How frustration, how frustration oriented are you? Am I often feeling frustrated and irritable? 
Do I typically respond to frustration by blaming others? Do I self-medicate letdowns with junk food, alcohol, or drugs? When frustration has passed, do I feel I've been misunderstood? When I feel disappointed, do I feel unworthy, like giving up? These are very common responses. So if you have three or four of these, it's very likely that we're talking about ego issues. So, what this session is about, the antidotes. How do you not achieve states of frustration? How do you not achieve states of disappointment? And the answer lies in the Hebrew word savlanut and the modern Israeli expression that looks like this, which some of you may have viewed when visiting Israel. Okay? This means patience, patience. So let's look at this word patience. What does patience mean? What's going on when you're trying to be patient? What are the dynamics within in attempting to be patient? Is patience one thing? Willing to wait. So willing to wait presupposes that there are dynamics taking place and you're enduring them. In other words, when we're talking in terms of patience, it's not just a word with one dynamic. It's probably many dynamics that are taking place. Okay, not only control and outcome. We're talking this as an antidote to that. But what is patience? We've already begun the uh, uh, definition. Having faith in an outcome. Yes. What's going on in your body? What's going on in your head and heart when you're attempting patience? You're frustration, frustrated with being patient. Yeah, okay. Is not patience a tension? There's a tension between your part of yourself wanting to act, wanting to say, wanting to do, another part of you holding you back, is not the product of a toing and froing, which wins in the direction of not toing, not froing? Isn't patience because something's acting on you and you're resisting? You don't have to be patient if there's no issue. Patience takes place when there is an issue. Let's create one. What might be an example of when patience needs to be called upon? We spoke this morning about type A personalities. And one of the characteristics of type A personalities was that they always interrupt other people's speech and conversation. They cannot wait for the end of the sentence. Okay? Give me an example of patience in your life. I'm waiting in line. Waiting in the line. All right? Waiting in the line at a bank. And there is only one teller, because all the other two tellers have gone out for lunch, as they always do. And there's only one teller and there's like 20 people in front of you, right? And you're asking yourself the question, how can this bank operate? Is this not a business institution? And look at the way they're treating the customers. And I'm, not go I'm going to complain. I'm, I'm going to change bank, which won't help you because you go to the next bank and exactly the same. But you're patient. What does that mean, you're patient? What feelings are you arbitrating? Okay, so one feeling that you're saying is me, me. Uh, it's, it's me. I want to do the banking. I need to get it done. And what's the other part? So why, what's the other part? Delaying gratification. Delaying gratification. As opposed to necessity. I can't do anything about this. Fatalism. It's going to be the way it's going to be. There's a world of difference between that and patience. 
Patience is a virtue, right? That's an old saying. But for vir- patience to be a virtue, it can't be simply a resort to fatalism. Well, that's the way it is. This is the bank and I'm banking here and there are 20 people in front of me. I've got no choice. And you'll be angry all the way until you get to the front uh, counter. And it'll continuously rub off on you and cause you all sorts of anguish and anxiety. That's not the case if you're patient. If you're patient, you shouldn't be in a state of anguish. If you're patient at that time, you shouldn't be anxious. So what are you when you're patient? You're relaxed. So you draw upon some position in life. You draw upon some aspect of the way that you've concluded you want to lead your life. To be a patient individual requires you to work things out in a very profound way. To become a patient person, and as you know, I always say, you don't have to be any any way the way that you're born. You can change anything you want about yourself. And you can change from being an impatient person to being a patient person, most definitely. But to do that, you have to work out some very basic things in life. To be a patient individual requires you to change your whole philosophy of life. To change your whole attitudinal response to the moment. To find a substitute for the otherwise anger, frustration that is going to take place and eat at you and cause you eventually illness, which it will. So there's a lot of work to becoming a patient individual. Likewise with frustration. Frustration, I'm saying that the same antidote is patience. Whether it's disappointment, whether it's frustration, patience is what we need to cultivate. How do you cultivate patience? And you welcome every opportunity that's there to frustrate you and disappoint you. You welcome it. Wow, here's another chance for me to practice. Each moment is you're on Carnegie Hall stage and there you are. I am sure that would be the case, but no, that's still not desirable. <laughs> it's not desirable. Look, both of you would know that. I was just now in Russia and I had... Uh, no, I'm going to tell you the opposite. I was in Russia just now and we had a, uh, uh, from the Lubavitch community a guide who was, who was um, a young woman in her young 20s and her parents were still in Crimea and she says her parents have to wait every day in a line to get any food in cri- Crimea today. That was because of the... No. But all I'm saying is, and I'm saying something different than you, the more acute the situation, the more deeply developed an individual you have to be. Hashem places you in a more acute situation because you have the potential. Hashem Hashem never placed me in that situation because I'd fail. Placed you in that situation because you've got the potential to pass. (laughs) No question about it. (laughs) At the end, it's mind over emotion. At the end, it's moach shalit Al Halev, as the Alter Rebbe notes in Sefer Tanya, the mind has to dictate the outcomes of the emotion. Emotions know no wisdom, but they have energy, and frustration and disappointment is full of energy. Patience requires wisdom. Wisdom is an action of the mind that has the compass bearing. In order to be able to take your energy and direct it positively, it must be first in line. 
Moach shalit al halev. The mind has to dictate the outcomes of the emotions. To be patient, you have to work it out with your mind first. And if you don't work it out with your mind, no taming of the emotion can take place. I mean, these are big statements, statements that are worthy of spending, you know, lessons and sessions on just on alone. And we're throwing these out just like headlines. But the truth of the matter is, they are the real headlines. Um, you talk about frustration. I get frustrated when I hear the news and what's happening. It's not ego, but I just get frustrated with what's happening. How do you have patience for that? Or you just hope things change? That's why I said there's a lot of work in terms of philosophical, theological, spiritual, working out of what life means to you. Because to be able to take life circumstances, and especially today they're at right in our lounge room because of the way the news is filtered into us, means that you and I have to have a much wider ambit and perception of reality. And we have to work it out. So to be not frustrated by the kind of news that we're getting means you have to have a really worked out theological position that says these challenges are here to draw from the deepest part of me and the world and you know what? I'm going to play a role on that stage. I'm not in North Korea. I can't tame that wild individual there. But you know what? I can do something in my own backyard to try to counter the kind of syndrome that he demonstrates. You have to do something in the world. Every time your eyes see something, as the Baal Shem Tov says, it's an instruction. Hashem never allows you to see something which isn't already an instruction for you. It's a teaching. And therefore, if this is what we're witnessing, it means there's something in our own backyard we have to do about it. To do that, you have to work it out. Look at that little... Um, lied about the Princeton experiment. A Princeton experiment showed that when subjects were impulsive, their emotion brain centers lit up their limbic system. And when they practiced patience, their cerebral brain centers lit up. Have a look. We're seeing on screen, in other words, that when mind defines the outcomes of emotions, when moyach is shalit alalev, you can actually witness it on screen. Here you have it. When the brain is operating, then you've got one particular pictorial representation. When you've got the other, then you've got the other one. All right? So emotions are identifiable in that way. So is the mind. Now, it's possible, therefore, to use a system that's been around for a long time called biofeedback, to be able to train yourself, and that is to watch yourself on the screen and try to induce on the screen that which you want done for you. That's a very good technique, but it's not a common one. And the common one is for you to sit down and work out what do I really mean about life and what should I be adopting as my positions in life. And in the next line, you've got the line that I quoted to you, the Alter Rebbe's dictum, Moach Shalit Al Halev, the mind should determine the flow of emotions. Delayed gratification, which is the term that you used over there before, is a master skill. It's what defines maturity from immaturity. Immature people cannot practice delayed gratification. Immature people want it now because it's I. And I, the Nefesh Bahamis, will always want it now. Delayed gratification is, it's not about I, it's about thou, it's about you, it's about the other. And therefore, you practice delayed gratification because that's maturity. And as I said to you, I think last week, a lot of children grow up to be immature adults. They still want the I want. I want your trains, I want your dolls except that the trains and the dolls are now your wives, your companies, your shares, your assets, etc. Same childish behavior, nevertheless. No different. So some people come back to me and say, but hold on, you're talking very cerebrally label. I want spontaneity in my life. I want to be able to be impulsive. 
I want to get out there and be spontaneous. What's wrong with that? Doesn't everyone like to live a life of spontaneity? There's a certain elation of spontaneity. But if you're a spontaneous murderer, it's not particularly useful to anyone else. Spontaneity alone is not anything that should be desired. To be spontaneous positively, you have to train and train and train and master and master and master until you are spontaneous at the thing that you want to be spontaneous at. And hopefully it's a good thing. And then you can enjoy spontaneity. Spontaneity alone is no virtue. To be positive through spontaneity, that's a virtue. And to be positive, you have to work it out and then you have to practice and make your body, your mind and emotions conform. Then you can be spontaneous. A pianist is spontaneous. They play the notes and yet their self flows through the notes. They're so familiar with the notes. They're so practised in the way that their fingers navigate the uh, keyboard and that their mind is connected to their fingers and they can be so adventurous in their mind. And they can be spontaneous. Perhaps better described in jazz terms when improvisation takes place. Because of the skill because of the practice, because of the connection of the mind through the emotion to the fingers and to the instrument, they can be spontaneous. If I were to pick up a guitar, which I don't play, and if I would be spontaneous, no one would call that improvisation. Some might today. We used to say that about modern art, right? right? <laughs> People are so set in their ways today that spontaneity, to me, is the ability to hear something and say, yeah, that's a really good idea, even though I always go home at this time um, to make dinner for my husband, what the hell, he could make his own dinner and I want to go do that with you. Yes. As opposed to my kids are three and four years old and they're hungry, so I'm going to leave it to... But that kind of spontaneity, a lot of people just don't have. They're used to doing things and you come up with something new and novel and it's like the immediate answer is no. We're introducing a different notion there called habit. And habit's a different idea altogether. Um, and how not to become a non-conscious, non-mindful, habitual practitioner of life is what you're describing. But spontaneity is something else. Spontaneity means that you are a master of the instrument of your body and soul and are able to respond to the situation in an immediate way, but you trust yourself because you're practiced in that regard. What you're talking about is living life mindfully and not habitually, which is unconsciously almost, and thereby being able to break patterns, but not because I want to, you use the word I want to, not because of that, not because I want to, but because there's merit in it. So you're talking about being in the moment in everything you do? Yeah. Yes, but being in the moment, which is not what some people think, which is just do what you want, when you want to do, with whomever you want to, how you want, uh, wherever you want. No, that's not being in the moment. In the moment means to be deep in the moment. It means what we call vertical living. Living at a profound level of the same moment. Another lecture, another time. So why are children more impatient more frustrated, express disappointment much more quickly. And we use the word because they're immature. Now, what do we mean by the word immature? We don't, not about here relatively, into about very, very down to earth. Don't have the skills, life experience. What does that mean? Why? Correct. It's because their brain hasn't finished growing. <coughs> but they're also living in the moment. They're it's like, but this is what, right now, this is what's exciting. No, no, in the moment, I said, was not that, remember? I said a lot of people say, in the moment is to do what I want to do, wherever I want to do, however I want to do it, when it with whomever I want to do. That's child childlike. To be in the moment is to be very profound and deep. They haven't got an experience of being knocked back. 
what so was... They haven't learned the so there's life experience and there is non-brain development, full brain development. And also children are all about me. Why? The, we're coming to the very, very point. And it's all because their brain hasn't yet been fully uh, developed. Yeah, but this is development. I'll and tell you. Connections, uh, get formed <coughs> Sorry? And, uh, certain connections get formed and they get, get formed as a result of certain experiences. Absolutely. But beyond that, it's like saying, um, here's the machine, but you know what? There's still five parts missing. <laughs> That's what a child is. We, we learn in Judaism that only at bar and bat mitzvah age is there complete maturity. And interestingly, as far as uh, uh, physiology is concerned, at 12 and 13, close to there is when the brain finishes growing. Really? Yeah. <coughs> Yes, You're physically. The parts are there. You as a person may not be there yet. <laughs> That's where what was said before, yeah. modeling and all the other things come into it. But the parts are always there. It's the actual, no? no? no. Okay. No. So why some children throw tantrums and some don't? There's aspects of personality, there's aspect of modelling, there's an aspect of genetic proclivity, etc. All these things create that. Some children are more mature, some children are less mature. There's all these vari variabilities. That's okay. Some of them don't accept no for an answer. That's also true. But we say when a child matures and becomes an adult, they become responsible. What does responsibility mean? If you want it in our classical Hasidic terms, the nefesh behamit, which is responsible for you, the I want, the I need, or what uh, Maslow called food, clothing, shelter, and then self-actualization model, that's all the nefesh behamit. That's lower order needs. They're the things that a child and uh, would instinctively demand and want. Maturity is when we move to the higher levels and then the nefesh elokit is able to express itself, the higher order self. Until the age of bar and bat mitzvah, the nefesh elokit doesn't yet come into its own to express itself. So the I want dominates constantly. However, when the nefesh elokit comes into its own, it begins to tame the nefesh behamit and your higher self starts to assert and you have the potential then to be compassionate and other-centered. Till then, you really don't. You might practice that as a child by copying your parents and therefore modeling it and even feeling good about it, but it's not yet real. It becomes real. All right. All religions preach the virtue of patience, right? Judaism, Buddhism, Christianity... Religions also tend to say, be careful what you pray for, it might just happen, meaning make sure you pray for what you truly need. And how do you? How do you know what you really need? So it's very hard when Rosh Hashanah is around the corner, what you're going to pray for. You know the expression which uh, we use in Yiddish, Menschen tracht und die Ebeste lacht. It rhymes in Yiddish. In English, it translates, people spend a lot of time planning and God laughs at their plans. Okay? The very thing that we plan and work for may be the worst thing for us. And God laughs and sets us on the right track and we get very frustrated. I'm not getting what I want. And Hashem says, of course not. I don't want you to have that because that's bad for you. So what are you going to pray for in Rosh Hashanah? It's a very difficult question. Do you know what's good for you? I guess you pray that Hashem leads you in the direction. That's direction. good. That's good. Because if you pray for what you want, be careful. You might just get it. And it may not be good. All right? The Dalai Lama said, when you lose... Don't lose the lesson. Also a nice little teaching. When things don't go your way, 
how we would translate, because Hashem is creating a very positive detour for you. Don't lose the lesson. Or the more profound philosophical teaching, Hashgacha Pratis. What's Hashgacha Pratis? Everything always occurs exactly as it should be. Everything. No exception to the rule. Everything that happens is exactly as it should be. Sometimes that's very painful. I don't want to talk about that. But let's talk about the 99% of things that happen in our daily life. Not the horrible things that happen, God forbid, 1% of the time. So the 99% of things that happen to you, they're great. You have to take a position of neutral curiosity as opposed to disappointment and as opposed to frustration. Neutral curiosity means, that's interesting. I wonder why I didn't win tests. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm the most deserving individual. And I would give 50% of it away if I would. And you start bargaining with God. I'll even do 60% if you... doesn't help. All right, there are four aspects of frustration, disappointment. Things aren't happening fast enough. You're not getting what you want. You're rejected and others let you down. If we had time, I would spend time analysing all frustrations and all disappointments into these four categories because they can be found in all these four categories. And when we say patience and delayed gratification and hashkacha protis, then we are doing, carrying out the antidote technologies against all these four. So... Sometimes people don't realise that they're frustrated or disappointed. So you can look at your body, like we began to look at our body at the beginning, but have a look at some of these aspects of your body when you're feeling that sense of frustration and disappointment. Tense and prickly, frayed at the edges, very serious and restless, like a lead ball tied to your ankle, trapped, whereas your body feels different in a state of patience. You're respectful, generous, pleasant, a feel of pleasant treading of water, soft, intuitively right. There's a lot of difference in the way, if you just stop for a moment and ask yourself, what is it that my body is feeling? You can identify almost instantly what that emotion is. The body is a giveaway. Any questions or thoughts? So once again, the purpose of these sessions is not to solve our problems, but to lead us to an insight where each person can begin to develop strategies to overcome these kind of challenges that we've been speaking to uh, about in this series. And each one has their own individualised approaches and capacities to be able to do so. But there are general principles, and we've tried to raise some of these general principles. I've raised them from the point of view of common sense, some from the area of uh, uh, modern science, and others from the area of Hasidic spiritual insight. Everything comes to p play a role in the solution. I hope to continue with this series um, later down the track. This is the last one of this particular series. And we're going to be approaching Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I want to wish you a Shana Tova. I want to wish you a lot of success and bracha for the coming year. A very, very sweet year. And you should always ensure that you make commitments on Rosh Hashanah because the commitments that you do on Rosh Hashanah have an extra strength level from above to assist their durability and their continuity. So take it really seriously. When you go to shul, don't try to daven the whole davening. Take time out just to make it really meaningful for you. There is an aura that descends on Rosh Hashanah which transforms it from any other year that ever lived, ever existed, where you lived. And therefore, take advantage of that changed aura and surf the waves of change. A good year. Be well.